Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. I'm John Wetherill, Principal Architect at BNY Mellon's Innovation Center in Palo Alto and member of the ACM San Francisco Bay Area Chapter. To learn more about my background, check out the bio widget on the left side of your screen. It is my pleasure to welcome you today. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Infosys Foundation Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows or Command R if you're on a Mac or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Adrian speaks and he'll reserve time at the end of the pre presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and it will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of this presentation, you'll see a survey open in your browser. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag #HashACMLearning. We'll be watching for your tweets. So today's presentation is the evolution of microservices with Adrian Cockroft. Adrian Cockroft has had a long career working at the leading edge of technology. He's always been fascinated by what comes next, and he writes and speaks extensively on a range of subjects. At Battery, he advises the th firm and its portfolio companies about technology issues and also assists with deal sourcing and due diligence. Before joining Battery, Adrian helped lead Netflix's migration to a large-scale, highly available public cloud architecture and the open sourcing of the cloud-native Netflix OSF platform. Prior to that at Netflix, he managed a team working on personalization algorithms and service-oriented refactoring. Adrian was a founding member of eBay Research Labs, developing advanced mobile applications and even building his own homebrew phone years before iPhone and Android launched. As a distinguished engineer at Sun, Sun Microsystems, he wrote the best-selling Sun Performance and Tuning book and was chief architect for high performance technical computing. He was named one of the top leaders in cloud computing in 2011 and 2012 by Search Cloud Computing Magazine. And without any further ado, Adrian, take it away. Thanks very much, John, and uh, thanks to the ACM for hosting this webcast.
Um, I'm going to talk about the evolution of microservices, but uh, first of all, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction to what I do. Um, I have a, a job. I was with Netflix for seven years, um, but for the last two and a half years, I've been at Battery Ventures, a venture capital firm. What I do there is due diligence on deals, advice for portfolio companies, networking with interesting people, which includes doing events like this, um, messing around with a few technologies and working on a lot of conferences and presentations. Um, what the VC side of the business wants to know is what are the technologies people are using, where are the gaps, how are things evolving, and how large and small companies uh, are going to adopt new technologies. So very interested to have conversations with anybody that wants to about that. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And um, obviously, if somebody wants uh, uh, to take a deal to a VC, um, well, that's one of the things we do. So um, let's look at the agenda. I'm going to talk a bit about why this is happening now. Um, what are the different architectures for microservices? Something about the things that are missing. Uh, a little bit about migration and simulation and, and the few uh, advanced topics of what's happening next. The way I think about this, this presentation is it really goes into why, what, and how for microservices. The why part is largely aimed at, at management, or it's the thing that, that it expresses why this is an interesting thing and why it's happening now. Then we look at what are the different architectures and how do they, uh, what are the choices are you going to have to make? And finally, we're looking at, you know, if you're deep into this, what are the things you're going to run into and what are the problems you're going to have to solve and give some uh, advice there. So to start off with, um, there's a business need for, for something new. What we're hearing from executives, CIOs, is they need to align IT with the business. They need to develop products faster, and they also need to try not to get breached. There's, there's lots of other things, obviously, but these are, these are the things that lead people to thinking about we need a new way of delivering software uh, because we are getting breached and our products are taking too long, and IT is often seen as a cost center rather than something that's enhancing the business. So from a security point of view, if, if the way the developer used to build something was they'd build an application thinking not too much about security, then give it to, it was operations and security team's job to wrap it in firewalls and make it secure and run it in a secure way and then in, put it into production. That, that's the old way. What we're seeing now is that it's important for the developers to own the security of the application and build things that are inherently secure and that security, part of that security comes from breaking an application into smaller pieces, which are each individually secure to, which, to the right level. And that's one of the motivations for taking the monolithic applications and breaking them into smaller pieces. There's, however, there's really two different paths into this. And I'm going to um, give a really sort of gross uh, characterization of these and say that you can kind of divide the world in, from a caricature point of view into web scale or enterprise. And they are both using microservices, but in a slightly different way and with different problems to solve. Web scale companies like Netflix uh, or, or Facebook or Google or LinkedIn, are, uh, they have a lot of freedom and responsibility and they are high trust companies. There, there's a lot of internal trust within the organization that covers a lot of things. So you can move fast, you can pioneer things, you can try things first. You don't need a lot of centralized control to make things work. There's still there's a lot of responsibility to make sure things don't break and things don't get um, don't get uh, breached. But it's something where there is a higher level of implicit trust in the organization. What we see in enterprise, which covers you know, enterprise, government, large organizations is that in order to manage a large organization, you end up with a lot of bureaucracy and basically a low trust environment where because you don't trust something or there's low trust across the organization, you end up, you know, there's a lot of blaming going on and things like that. So how does this, how does everyone get speed and, and in both of these types of architectures? Well, what happens is, 
if you if you have this as a if you can split things into smaller chunks and disaggregate then it can help so i'll go through a very crude example let's assume we have a monolithic application it's got a front end and a back end database and it has the sort of fairly typical things that you have to sign up to it. There's some kind of payment method that's being stored. You have to log in. It's storing some personal data, and it's generating some kind of output. And there's a home page that you visit to, to get your information. Now, because part of this has sensitive data, all of it has to be dealt with in a sensitive way. The fact that there's a payment method in there and personal data means the entire application is subject to things like PCI and SOX and other compliance. And what we'd really like to do is be able to iterate really fast on the home page and the reports while keeping the rest of it secure. So if we break this into an architecture that looks like this, we have six different services here. The ones marked in red are highly secure. They're managed by a team that is you know, doing relatively slow updates. It's the thing you interact with once as you sign up. And the green section is the area where a separate team is iterating really quickly to make the user experience for repeated accesses really fast. And we've both got a combination of the best security on one side and the best agility on the other side because we've managed to split it into two. The other thing is, if you look at the data access, each the connections between services are largely, uh, they're much smaller in scope. So, for example, the login service needs to read some personal data to uh, authenticate the login, but it's only doing that one thing. In the monolithic case, the entire front end has basically arbitrary access into the back end and the connection on the, to the database has lots of different requests on it. And it's hard to tell whether all those requests are secure or auditable or whatever. In this case, we can lock down single purpose accesses because each connection has only got one kind of thing on it. So this leads to uh, another issue, which is how do we segment these systems? If we want to deploy both of these environments, how do we split them up? The way that I did a whole presentation I called In Search of Segmentation, you can find on my SlideShare account. But this is just a couple of slides summary of this issue. In the old days, we had operations that created data centers. They set up Active Directory and LDAP roles. They controlled the networks. They'd provision a hypervisor. They'd use IP tables to set up firewalls and things like that. And then the uh, developer would deliver their application into it. Maybe they got to deliver their application as a collection of, of Docker uh, images, Docker, Docker containers that are linked together, but they're sort of delivered as a bundle. So that's in fairly operations-controlled infrastructure. But what we have now is, is a growing movement to developer-driven infrastructure. So your, your Docker links aren't just within one machine. You're now using DockerNet to uh, create an, a network. So you're actually creating the network layer from directly from Docker, or you're using a, a protocol uh, overlay network like Weave, which lets you do things like multicast and other advanced networking that are hard to do otherwise. You control IP tables globally using something like Calico, uh, which has a policy framework for controlling that level of, of the network. Instead of managing hypervisors directly, you're using security groups to control security uh, at, at the cloud level. You're using Amazon VPC, which is programmed by the developer, or perhaps by operations, but it's under software control. And you're using networks, uh, clouds with IAM roles, identity and access management roles, to manage who can do what. And you're splitting things into AWS accounts rather than data centers. So where in the old world you, were, you thought you had a lot of control from the operations side because the developers couldn't get in and mess with these things, on the new world, it's all driven from developers, and we have to rethink how we manage these things and who is allowed to do what. But again, it's to get the agility we want, this has to be programmable. So we end up with some kind of segmentation that looks like this. You have a number of AWS accounts, which are very gross levels of workloads or teams. Then you have 
VPCs, which are segmenting different applications maybe within those teams. And then you have security groups for teams that are working on different parts of an application. And you use containers for each of those teams to deliver pieces of that application and connections between them. So this is just one example, but the problem here is you have to coordinate all these different layers of, of segmentation. That's all I have to say on that for now. So I'm going to move on to another topic. This is something that uh, Werner Vogel said in an ACM paper in 2006. You build it, you run it. And it's really one of the first expressions of what later became known as DevOps. This is, we read this paper in 2008, 2009 at Netflix, and we figured out that what the right thing to do if we wanted to go really fast was put the developers on call, make them responsible for the, whatever they had running in production. So the breakdown of who, of what, who developed what didn't really change, but instead of a developer developing a JAR file, which they then put on the network, sort of put into a repository, and then it was built by the QA team into an image which was then deployed by operations. What happened instead was that JAR file went straight into a single AMI or single container, and that was delivered and deployed by the developer as often as they wanted to. But that means they are on call because they're the only people that know what state it's in. There isn't time, if you're delivering multiple times a day, to have a meeting with operations people and you know, write some documentation and have a sign-off. We're running at a pace where the only person that knows the configuration of something is the person that last touched it, and that's the developer. What we found when we did that was miraculously, developers got really good at writing reliable code. They, they, if you wake them up at 3 a.m. a few times, they pay a lot more attention to not shipping things that are likely to break at 3 a.m. They actually, without even being told, learned that it wasn't a good idea to ship new code on Fridays or late in the afternoon before they wanted to go home. The other thing that happens is it encourages pair programming. If you ever want to go off call, somebody else has to know your code well enough to be able to support it. So this is actually, this is really a systems thinking approach. We created a system by providing fe negative feedback into developers, which caused them to have a whole bunch of really useful behaviors. Now you have small teams of people code reviewing each other's code so that one person on that team can handle any outage of, of this group of services and then maybe one week in four and they're on call. That kind of thing naturally evolved out of just putting people in line of fire for anything that went wrong. So that means developers are now responsible for how fast they can deliver value. So time to value is really what we're optimizing for in the microservices environment. That's the driving metric. How fast from you can you get from an idea to an implementation of that idea that a customer is interacting with, and you can find out whether it was a good idea or not. Because they're deploying directly, they're also responsible for the efficiency of what they're doing. So that's efficiency or how cheap it is. And then they're also responsible for the security of it. And you need to understand how to run penetration tests in your development and build environments and deploy environments automatically, and also how to um, manage keys and security and secrets uh, at a very fine grain. So everything you read from a database could be individually secured by a different key, rather than saying, well, this database is running on, say, a secure file system underneath. You want to have the security be per applic you know, very application-driven. So that's what's been happening. So why has this happened now? Well, in the old days, we had data sender snowflake machines that we deployed in months that lived for years. Um, and, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we were doing SOA. And this sounds like SOA. It's the same reasons that we did SOA, service-oriented architecture. The difference from 10 years ago is that um, we were trying to do XML and SOAP processing, which is relatively inefficient, on machines that were, like, say, a tenth of the speed they are now and with a tenth of the memory that we have now. And it was just, it meant that when you broke things into pieces for SOA, you had to keep the grain size fairly large because there was relatively inefficient transfers when you made requests between systems. Nowadays, it's you know, hundreds or thousands of times more efficient to make requests between machines. And so we can break the system into many smaller systems. So this is why, really, this is the essential difference between microservices and SOA. It's architecturally the same, but it 
we have moved on to a point where we can go to much finer grain, and I think that's why the micro word sort of came along. I originally called this architecture fine grain SOA, and other people called it microservices, and I just adopted the name. So we've moved on from, from data center snowflakes. Then we had virtualization and cloud, where it takes minutes to deploy. Things live for weeks, and that's fine. You get charged by the hour. That's a major speed up. But then a year or two ago, we had containers come along. Now we're deploying in seconds, and it's fine for systems to live for minutes or hours. In fact, uh, there, was a new, there was a report from New Relic where they looked at uh, the population of, of Docker containers that were reporting into New Relic. They found the most common lifetime for a Docker container was one minute, and the second most common lifetime was zero minutes. This also illustrates that if you're measuring stuff by the minute and things are happening by the second, you've got a bit of a problem in your monitoring system. You really need to have a system that can see what's happening by the second nowadays. Now, as obviously, this, we can take this even further. And what we're seeing over um, starting to get traction this year is serverless deployments, particularly AWS Lambda. This deploys in tens of milliseconds, and it's perfectly OK to have a machine exist for half a second. You get charged by the 100 millisecond for each invocation. So we've really here taken serverless architectures and and, and just gone from uh, taking forever to get a machine down to milliseconds to get a machine. And that that's the underlying technology which has led us to wanting to deploy things really, really quickly. Because what every time we manage to decrease the cost and the size and the risk of change, we're able to increase the rate of change. These two things work together. So we're able to be faster at deploying things and lower risk because each time we're deploying smaller and smaller pieces. So if we look at a definition of microservices, my definition is loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded contexts. By loosely coupled, I mean you can deploy every piece of it independently. You're not tied to, I have to modify my database schema before I can deploy all my pieces, or I have to deploy all the pieces at once because they're intimately tied together. Uh, if you have a lot of coupling in your architecture, then that could, that's better described as a distributed monolith, which has its own set of problems. And that's quite a lot of distributed monoliths out there. What we're trying to get to is the abilities for individual developers to deploy their work continuously. Then bounded context is how you figure out how big each of those services should be. You want to make sure that you've got a, a, a single function that does one thing that hopefully one developer can understand and uh, modify fairly easily, and you understand who's upstream calling you and what your downstream dependencies are. Now, not everything should be built out of microservices. If you have a small team building something quickly, it's better to go with a lot of scaffolding, something like Ruby on Rails, where in you know, a few hours you can stand up an entire website because so many things are decided for you before you start. If you want to deploy microservice architecture, you could spend weeks just trying to figure out which components to build. In this diagram, there's sort of a blank template. The way I think about this is in order to decide on a microservice architecture, you have to put names of things, products, tools, open source projects, services in every single one of these boxes and, this, and think about them. So what we're really finding is that microservice architectures are being adopted by large organizations who are trying to co coordinate hundreds of developers to build large-scale systems. It's less useful when you've got a handful of people that are sitting in a room together all day working on the latest startup. But there is also a transition where you go from your Ruby on Rails stack on one machine to needing more machines. And the, thing, the, the one thing I would always recommend is making it really easy to add new data stores. One of the problems you get when you get an oversized monolith is that you, there's too many different pieces of data tangled together in the data store because you had a data store, so that's where all the data goes. You want to make it really easy to have data that doesn't belong together be in separate data stores and build different front ends, different back ends, and build out that way. So you, this, this pattern is sometimes called back end for front end or BFF, and some of the microservices uh, books talk about this. It's a sort of transitional state where you can gradually migrate from a, a monolith into a microservice architecture as you grow. Uh, 
So if we look at next generation applications, I've put some names in here of things that I think are currently interesting. This is not complete. Obviously, I couldn't fit everything in. But what I mean by tooling is the what the developer interacts with to get something built. Uh, so you're working with AWS Lambda or one of the frameworks that supports it. You're building Docker containers. And then something like Spinnaker, which is a Netflix project, is used to deploy a container or a piece of code into production with step-by-step -step, um, and managing the workflow of doing that for each individual uh, developer. So you build a, you, it basically manages a series of deployment pipelines which are individually customized. For example, if you're redeploying something that's got to be PCI compliant, you might have several extra checks in there, an approval process. But if you're deploying something that's modifying the back end of a personalization algorithm, it may go straight to production with no checks every time you check code in. So you can set up different pipelines and you can uh, basically manage what has to happen and the testing and moving it to production and canary testing and things like that. So as it goes out, you're going to need to configure it. Um, it let's say you want to uh, change a, a, t a timeout or turn on a feature, something like that. The Netflix project Archaeus builds that. It's an open source project. There's also a company called Launch Darkly uh, for dark launching features um, that's a, as a service. And more recently, just in the last week, uh, the company Chef has re released a new product called Habitat, which is effectively a wrapper that lets you configure immutable services or objects with a lot more control over what you can do to it and a lot more information about how it was built uh, and where it came from and all the transitive dependencies and things like that. So it's, it's a brand new project. People are still figuring it out. And it's an open source project written in Rust, which is also an interesting new, new trend. So that's, that's configuration. When services are running, they need to talk to each other and find each other. So Eureka is the Netflix OSS project that does that. There's also a lot of people using Etcetera D and Console. Um, lots of choices here and slightly different characteristics for each one. When you want to send a message from some one place to another, um, you're going to want to link them together. So the routing can be done using uh, Compose for Docker Compose or Weave. And also there's a, a company that's taken the Twitter Finagle um, framework, which was open sourced, and has built uh, Linkerd on top of that. So that's a, that's a new new emerging one to go look at. And then you want to be able to see what's happening. So uh, Zipkin is an end-to-end -end tracing tool, uh, again, out of the Twitter uh, collection of, of tools. It's being gradually turned into a standard called Open Tracing, which is uh, a standardized form of Zipkin that's an evolution of it. Prometheus is another open source project out of SoundCloud that uh, collects all the metrics from a system and feeds them into monitoring systems. And Hystrix is a circuit breaker system out of the Netflix packages. So all of those things uh, are attributes of how you build your microservice architecture. Underneath that, you're going to need some data stores. The idea is that your front ends should be all uh, stateless. They shouldn't have any local storage. You should have a layer that is storing your data for you. That would be based on a, typically um, a distributed ephemeral storage system like Cassandra is very scalable, can handle wide area distribution. If you don't need to distribute the data too far or you don't need extremely high availability, then you may orchestrate some, let's say, MySQL or Postgres, something like that. Or you may just use a database as a service like Amazon's DynamoDB. So that's the database layer. Then there's a lot going on right now in, uh, in container scheduling. So that's typically state-of-the-art system is you have a bunch of containers and you want to get them deployed. Um, I had somebody say they were waiting for the number of container schedules to drop to two so they could run, pick the two winners. And I had bad news for them that there were three new ones this week, and we're going in the opposite direction. There's really a lot of choice here. It's uh, If you think about um, the evolution of technology, there's an innovate stage where lots of new ideas are being tried out. And then things gradually commoditize as everyone decides what this core set of functionality is. Things get well understood. And you end up in the end with a lot of implementations that look roughly the same and perhaps a few dominant players. We're still in the early stages of this. 
But what I think is is likely to happen is that the major battle here is for what to do in private clouds and on-premise in infrastructure. I think in the public clouds, the end state, we're not there now, but the end state is that they will just commoditize the ability to run a container and to integrate it into everything else. So you'll see uh, ECS gradually add features. Um, I think on Azure, uh, Mesos is, is probably an interesting one because uh, there was a recent large investment in, in Mesosphere from, from Microsoft, so that's how I'm saying that. Looks like a plausible one for them. And then Google Container Service, which has got Kubernetes as its sort of public um, um, thing that you can run anywhere. So that's the, that's what I think is going on in that space. It's evolving pretty rapidly right now. The one that's actually in use in at scale is probably Mesos right now with Kubernetes because a lot of people interested in it and probably the easiest one to get started at a swarm and nomad. So it sort of depends where you where you want to play right now. Underneath that, you're going to pick a language. And if you're in Java, you probably want to do everything with, with Spring Cloud. Um, if you're, uh, but most people starting from scratch now are using Go, and a few people are starting to look at Rust. So, if you're connecting all these things together, you're going to store your pieces and get. You're going to get entire services out of Docker Hub. You're going to store pieces of services in something like uh, JFrog's Artifactory, and you're going to connect the pieces together um, with protocol specifications, which is what DataWise Quark is about. I'll talk a bit about that later. And underneath this, you're going to have to figure out a security model. Docker has the content trust model where you you sign the, con the container pieces as you make them, and they go all the way to production, and you can tell with cryptographically uh, signed certificates that the thing you're running in production has not been tampered with and exactly what pieces it was made from. And when you find a problem with a piece, you can go find everywhere in your infrastructure that it's running and change it out. And the automation for that is sort of the emerging area here. If you, I'm tending to see people in the, previously I was talking about web scale and enterprise. And the web scale companies like to be try out lots of different things, and they're looking for a flexible platform. This is where you build it out of your own pieces, and things like Docker give a very flexible platform for building out an infrastructure uh, platform. When you want to have a more constrained platform, um, and I'm seeing a lot of this in government and large organizations, they look for things like Cloud Foundry because you're taking away a lot of the architectural decisions and saying you're just going to do it this way, everyone's going to do it this way, there's a value to having everyone do it the same way. And it's a bit kind of like an on-premise Heroku in some sense. So there's, those are really the decisions at that point, how tied down you want to be and what's the value of everyone doing it the same way, particularly in a low-trust organization versus giving everyone a lot of freedom to innovate in a high-trust organization. All right, let's move on a little bit to some of the things that may go wrong, some of the interesting problems. This is a really specific one, but I think it's something that isn't particularly obvious until you see it, and then it becomes that much clearer. Let's assume you have an edge service, and it's got an intermediate service that's talking to another service, and they're all in a good state right now. Make a request, it goes out, and it comes back. Hopefully you can see the animation. Um, and now... We have a broken service on the right. The, 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 bottom, the, the rightmost service fails, and let's see what happens. There's the first request, it failed. There's the second request, it failed. And there's some extra timeouts and retries happening in the middle service. And what you can see now is the service in the middle, which actually had nothing wrong with it, is now overloaded by the fact that it's got too many retries happening against a failed downstream service. Because it's, it's made nine requests, it's had three incoming requests, and that is quite often enough when when it, when this is when a system is running at high traffic rates to ta totally overload that middle service and cause an escalating failure. So what we had here was what seems like a normal sort of sensible thing. Let's just have everyone default to a common timeout and retry pattern. Turns out that doesn't work. What do we have to do? What we want to do is budget it. We want to have a timeout at the edge, which is longer 
than the sum of all timeouts and retries of the things it's going to call. And you're on, this is obvious once you look at it, but what happened here was that this service in the middle no longer overloaded. I haven't changed anything about these services except the timeouts. The service failed. It didn't cause overload in the middle. There's one extra retry, which is relatively insignificant. And it was able to respond to the edge before the edge timed out and say, hey, that didn't work. What do you want to do about it? It may give up. It might retry again. But the point is that the edge service was able to find out that something had failed um, without, having, without doing a bunch of extra retries. And there's no unproductive work in this. But there's an optimization here. Often what we've got is multiple copies of each service. And this is actually the way that the Netflix libraries, and I've also heard that the Uber have another, their own framework, but it does the same thing. If you get a failure talking to a service, you don't retry on that service. You retry against another one. So if you fail on one connection, you try a different connection, it's going to a different instance of the service, it's quite likely to work. That failed service may just be in the middle of a garbage collect if it's in Java, or it may have just you know, had a little fit for a few seconds, but it may come back again. But the point is that you can find a good one because you typically have a wide array of systems. In this case, you get a successful response after a short delay. So if you do nothing but go and think about your timeout strategies, you can actually fix a lot of problems in microservice deployments. There's one extra complication here. This is a very simple example. I know this is an edge service. I know this is a middle service. I can obviously see the, the cascading effect. If you've got a more complex system, you might want to have a timeout budget that is passed from service to service and is decremented by each service based on how long that service typically takes to respond. When you get to a point where there's no budget left, you then fast fail and respond back up. Um, but in making sure you have time to respond back up to the edge. That's the model that you know, you know, the, the latest version of what Netflix and Uber and other people have built are actually using that model. It's, that's appropriate when you have hundreds of services and you're not quite sure who's going to be calling who. All right, let's look at monitoring. There are a few issues with monitoring. This is kind of my collection of what I call Death Star diagrams. Um, these are the architecture diagrams of when you have hundreds of microservices. It's hard to tell. There's actually a lot of structure here, but it's very hard to draw it in a way that makes sense because everything looks like it's calling everything else. If we abstract from that to a much simpler architecture, like the canonical simple architecture for something like a Netflix OSS deployment, it looks a bit like the diagram here on the left. You have an endpoint calling a load balancer. That splits traffic into three zones. Those, uh, the, it, the first thing they hit is an API proxy. They talk to some business logic. That talks to a data access layer. That talks to something like a Cassandra data store. This diagram actually comes from a simulator that I've built. It's on GitHub. Um, you can go to simianviz.search.sh if you want to play with these diagrams in, in your browser. Uh, or you can go visit the GitHub site if you want to look at um, or playing and building your own architectures for this. So to get a simple architecture, uh, you just have to de define the dependencies. And this is the file you'd have to create to draw the diagram that's shown in the top right, uh, which is sort of a LAMP architecture of sort of a, a web server and something like PHP and uh, Monolith and, um, and, and MySQL and, uh, and Memcache. So you just set this thing up. Given this input file, uh, which is called you know, lamp.json, it's stored in a particular directory full of architectures, the next thing shows you how you run my, my Spigo program. You just say, I want the architecture to be lamp, I want to generate output in JSON format, and I want to run for a duration of two seconds, which is long enough to read the data in, which takes a fraction of a second, run it for two seconds, which generate all the output files. So you can see on the timestamps, this runs for two seconds. That's enough to generate plenty of output that you can then go look at to see how your architecture would behave and how you would be able to visualize that architecture. You can get obviously very complex architectures with this. I mentioned Zipkin before. This is a common format for trace annotations and a Java tool for visualizing traces. And as I said before, the open tracing format is working to extend this. Uh, and Adrian Cole, who I previously worked with for a while when, when we both worked at Netflix, is currently at Pivotal and is pushing this format forward. 
he extended this to take the Spigo generated trace files. So I'm generating output from my simulator that is in Zipkin format. And all that Adrian had, Cole had to do was add the ability to post a Zipkin format JSON file into the Spigo tool. When I do that, I get a diagram that looks a bit like the kind of diagrams you see when you look at your web browser to figure out why, why something's slow. Um, you can see here there's seven different microservices. You can see the requests daisy chaining down them with a bunch of puts and then a replicates at the bottom. So this is a put into the data store with a triple replicated data store. You can tell this is running in the simulator because the entire thing runs in 150 microseconds. So in, within the simulator, what I'm actually doing is I'm simulating each microservice as a Go routine. And I'm simulating each network link as a Go channel. And I'll be talking a bit more about this architecture in a presentation at GopherCon uh, next month. But the, what this does is it's vastly more efficient than deploying real machines to the cloud. I can build an architecture here which is capable of stress testing the Zipkin tool and any other performance monitoring tool that, work, that you can interface to this. So I'm simulating architectures for the purposes of stress testing monitoring tools primarily, although it can be used for other purposes. And it runs about a thousand times faster than it would in real life, so that's another useful att attribute. I can sim I've simulated up to 100,000 nodes on my laptop in a couple of gigabytes of RAM. So obviously this is cheap and fast compared to running a real system, and that's really the value of having a simulator here. On the um, website, if you go to the uh, Surge site, you, you see something like this. And one of the architectures we have there is a migration architecture. So I'll step you this, through this pretty quickly. There's a little button you can click to go to the next step. Um, there's a charge thing which you can use to set uh, the amount of negative charge that causes these little, the, the little circles in the, in the diagram to move further apart. And um, it starts with this, basically, a, a LAMP stack. There's an endpoint, a load balancer, um, a PHP layer, and some MySQL. So the idea here is you can mouse over this and look around if you look at it in real life on this, on this model. The next two steps, if you hit step twice, the first step is it adds a memcache. If you mouse over, it shows you the connections and dependencies that so helps you navigate the model. This is all written using JavaScript D3, so it's running in your browser. And this is running using the output from, from Spigo, which was previously run uh, to generate all of the, the output files. So we're not running against a live simulation. We're sort of picking over the remains. Looking at the next one, I've added a web proxy between the load balancer and the, web, and the, you know, the PHP code or whatever I had. So this is the first step if you're trying to migrate from a monolith to a microservices environment. You put in an API proxy between, in front of whatever you'd built, and initially it's just a pass-through. The next thing you want to do is add a data access layer in front of the database. It should be the only thing that's allowed to talk to the database. It should contain all of the MySQL or drivers or, or Cassandra drivers. Above that, everything should be REST calls. So at this point, you have to go to your code base and take out all of the uh, data access pieces, all of them, all the SQL pieces, all those things, and gradually work through it, replacing those with web service calls into the data access layer. Once you've done that, you can then add new microservices, in which are sandwiched between the, the virtualization layer at the API and the virtualization layer at the database. Obviously, you can do this with multiple databases, multiple endpoints, but now you can start breaking off pieces. Um, and this is sometimes known as the strangler pattern. You're surrounding your monolith above, below, and to the side, and you just keep piecing, picking pieces off. The next step that might be interesting is to switch the data store. And I've shown here what happens if you add Cassandra to the system. Your data access layer can simultaneously, and without your application knowing, talk to, say, MySQL and Cassandra. It can manage which table is where, and it can man manage replication and um, keeping everything in sync, right? Your application no longer cares what type of database it's talking to because you made everything into REST web calls, web services. <laughs>
bit later, once you've finished migrating your database schemas, um, you remove MySQL. Now you have a pure uh, Netflix OSS application running in a single region. It's triple replicated across zones. It's extremely resilient. Now you can lose an entire zone, one of these three legs of the application, and the system will maybe have a few timeouts for a few seconds and then keep running. This is basically how to survive a zone outage in a cloud or a data center outage, an entire data center outage in an on-prem environment. But what this also lets you do in the simulator, you, there's an extra command for adding regions. So I can add a region, and in this case, I'm adding two separated regions. The, the DNS endpoint that I'm simulating basically simulates geographic splitting at the DNS level. So all of my East Coast customers go to one system, or my West Coast customers go to another system. You can then also connect the Cassandra region so that you've got a multi-region Cassandra cluster with two regions in front of it, and any data written on the West Coast gets copied asynchronously to the East Coast. Finally, we can add a third region. In fact, the simulator can go more and more regions. It just gets harder to visualize. This is actually this model is actually an incredibly simple version of the way that Netflix is actually currently deployed. Netflix is deployed across East Coast, West Coast, and Europe, three regions on AWS. It's in three zones per region. And behind it, there's a bunch of Cassandra clusters that are triple region. So there's nine copies of the data. All data is replicated everywhere. And every, any time there's a regional outage, they just have the traffic just gets switched to the other two regions. And every now and again, they test this. So they shut down all traffic to, say, US East, and they serve everyone on the East Coast out of Europe and the West Coast. And they've talked about this in public, and they run that test roughly once a month. So that's an interesting step-by-step -step guide. I was trying to show how you can go from a monolith with all the characteristics of a monolith to a fully scaled, highly replicatable, highly scalable application running on a microservices architecture. Obviously, you could have a lot more microservices in this as well as the back end. And in practice, there would be a lot more back ends. It just gets hard to show what the picture looks like. So the other thing I wanted to show here is the architectural principles I'm using. There's a huge amount of symmetry in this system. There are a lot of invariants. We can say every region is the same. Every zone is the same. Uh, that gives a set of stable assertions, no special cases. That's a very powerful attribute that means that the architecture, even though it, it's got lots of moving parts, it's actually extremely simple to manage and to think about. So I'm going to briefly go through a little discussion about what's next and talk about serverless, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few questions. So serverless architectures. You can think of cloud as, in some sense, being buildingless architectures. Right? You don't care where your machines are anymore. You don't know what building they're in. You just have these machines. With serverless architectures, you don't care where your machines are. You don't think about machines. You just have pieces of code. You have a cloud function that you're trying to run. AWS came out with this about a year and a half ago. People are actually using this in production now, and we're getting some early wins with it. Google earlier this year came out with cloud functions. Azure came out with Azure functions, Microsoft Azure functions. Those are a sort of alpha stage right now. And then IBM came out with an open source toolkit called OpenWhisk, which is, again, a, basically a clone of this with a few, few extensions, but aimed at the on-premise market. And there's also some startups. Iron.io is working in this space. As a, you can also get a couple of toolkits from serverless.com and apex.run, which is, makes AWS Lambda easier to use. So what is the architecture of this? Well, it looks a bit like this quite often. This is all there is. There aren't any machines in the architecture. If there's no traffic going to it, there's nothing in the middle. You have an API gateway, which you could send traffic to. Behind it, there's a database, maybe Kinesis, which is a log analysis uh, pipeline, and S3, which is an object store. But until you send it a request, there is nothing running, and the only cost you're paying for is the storage cost for the databases. When you send it a request, it goes through the system and follows a path and triggers a bunch of events, and things tend to chain from one place to another. But in practice, you may have a bunch of other Lambda functions kicking around which haven't been invoked by this. So the architecture is more like the potential architecture. And it's actually 
Um, the, the tooling around figuring out what your architecture looks like is, is a little bit nascent because you don't put an agent on all these machines and have them report into an APM service like AppDynamics where you could draw the architecture because they're not running. They, they just get invoked by an event. They log the fact that they were invoked, but you have to go scrape the logs to figure out what it looks like. Amazon has published some reference architectures for common use cases. Um, and let's just look at the programming model. It's an event-driven function. There are role-based permissions. The function is in a role. That role gives it access to keys, which let it do things. It's whitelisted APIs. The role it's in lets it talk to a particular S3 bucket or, or a particular DynamoDB or some other um, uh, function it wants to talk to. And because these functions are being invoked, it lots of them in parallel, you can run simple single-threaded code like JavaScript and Python without having to worry about multi-threading it. When you run this, it's very efficient. There's 100% of useful work. You haven't got any agents running on your machine that you're paying for. It's 100% utilization because you don't get charged between requests. You don't need to size extra capacity for peak traffic. The system just sizes whatever it needs to be. And anecdotally, there have been a number of reports that if you take an existing system and convert it to uh, AWS Lambda from AWS's normal instance types, you get a cost around 1%. So a system that's $100 a month ends up being about a dollar a month of Lambda. That really depends on what your traffic looks like. So this is ideal for low traffic, things like corporate IT, where systems are idle at nights and weekends and have spiky traffic during the day. Work in progress. There's still a lot of tooling needed to make this easier to use. There's patterns needed for highly available um, multi-region, uh, highly available DR patterns, because if Lambda itself, the function, if the functionality goes down in one region, obviously everything's going to stop in that region. There's a need for debugging, testing frameworks, and monitoring, and some end-to-end -end tracing. So this is, this is happening, and it's an interesting area. And if somebody's working in the startups in this space, I'd certainly like to hear from you. If you try to do this yourself, DIY serverless, you're running into a bunch of challenges. The time it takes to schedule a container or a, or a cloud function is actually, on a lot of systems, quite substantial. Um, you can't take too long to, to serve a piece of code that's expected to run for half a second. You have to do it in very quickly. It's what I'm hearing from people using AWS is it's tens of milliseconds. But if you use something, one of the off-the-shelf container schedulers, you'll find that it's, there's a lot of coordination and network traffic involved, and it could often take you know, a substantial fraction of a second just to figure out where to schedule a container. So that's the execution overhead. There's also the charging model. You can't spend more on billing than you spend on the thing you're billing for. And then how do you size a system when you don't know how many containers are going to come in? This is a case where it's good to have lots of customers sharing a, a Lambda or fun cloud function backend because then you can aggregate together all of the, the requests. All right, we have about five minutes left. Um, these are some books to read. If you're interested in how to think about the art business value you're optimizing for. The Art of Business Value is a great book by Mark Schwartz. He's the CIO of Department of Homeland Security's Immigration Naturalization Service. That service is running inside a huge bureaucracy, and he is running it as a very agile, using very agile continuous delivery mechanisms. He's running, um, he's running Netflix-style chaos monkeys in the government. And the book is a great view into how he thinks about operating agile teams in bureaucratic, low-trust organizations. Building Microservices by Sam Newman is required reading. For, it just That's all needs to be said, really. It's got lots of great advice. Um, if you're getting into Lambda, there's a few books starting coming out. This is a fairly short book, um, and uh, there's, there's more stuff coming, but it's an interesting introduction to Lambda architecture. So just to tidy things up, um, this is a, one of my favorite quotes just to end on. We, we see the world as increasingly more, com more complex and chaotic because we use inadequate concepts to explain it. When you understand something, you no longer see it as chaotic or complex. And in this case, I see people saying that microservices look complicated, but actually they are less complicated than the monoliths that they're replacing. The internal complexity of monoliths and the internal complexity 
complexity of uh, kitchen sink schemas, that database schemas that have everything tangled together. That's the complexity. By breaking things into simple functions, we are basically reducing the complexity and we're managing it and making it more apparent. So let's go to Q&A and uh, get John back on the phone. And uh, if anyone wants to know what, what I do at Battery, here's a, a bunch of the uh, portfolio companies that I, I work with. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Things are advancing rapidly in this field uh, considerably since I last saw you talk about a year ago. You made a lot of progress. It's pretty amazing. So we've had a, a number of questions come in, and many of them are actually related to the complexity issue address, you addressed just at the end. And uh, we have time for maybe two or three, so I'll run through these quickly. Uh, one question that came in is, um, how, how can you deal with debugging a distributed application? Um, I know you mentioned in the serverless part there's work to be done there, but how about in a general microservices uh, architecture? How, how do you deal with debugging? People are used yeah. to debugging a monolith, right? Sure. There's, there's tools and there are some products and some tools here. Um, on the sort of open source tooling side, uh, you can use Zipkin or Open Tracing to embed that into your system. And depending on what language you're doing, there are bindings for different languages in Go and Java and other things. Um, that gives you the ability to collect a trace end-to-end -end through the system. Um, there's, you just go look, look up how Zipkin works. Um, but it requires you to change your code to add a context that is sent in the header in each request. So that's, that's a little more overhead. If you want to do it automatically, then you can look at it from the either the system call level or the network level, and there are people doing both of those. There's a tool called Sysdig, which lets you see what's going on, and it's very good at looking at container architectures and uh, container scheduler architectures. It understands that you have a bunch of Docker containers being controlled by Mesos or Kubernetes, and will visualize that for you. That works at the system call level on each machine. And then there's, uh, there are also tools looking at the network layer and stitching back together what's, who's talking to who by, by looking at that. Uh, on AWS, it's possible to get a feed from AWS that gives you the connection metadata for a VPC. So they will actually tell you what connections are happening and give you that feed as a service. And it's possible to build visualization on that rather than having to instrument machines individually. Very interesting. Okay. And another uh, similar question is, how about uh, dealing with latency issues? You've got a lot of communication overhead and complexity with, you know, uh, branching yeah. everything out into multiple services. How do you deal with latency? Sure. Um, yeah, some of my other talks, I've had, I have a few slides on that. I was trying to fit in the time today. Um, the way I like to put it is if, you move, if you're copying, if, if your idea of a, of a call between two services is to send a megabyte of XML, you, you will get sad. I'm sorry. Um, you want to send things in that are small, and you want to send them in an efficient encoding format. So uh, that's that's kind of the the, the overall goal. Um, the way I would do it is I would use a binary uh, encoding that is very efficient for the internal calls between systems, things where you really control both the client and the server within your organization. External services, you have, it's whatever the service wants, but quite often it's JSON. So if you're creating an externally visible API, put a JSON payload on the interface because that's kind of most of the time web browsers and external systems I will be very familiar with that. And it's generally the request rate and the latency, it sort of ties in. You, you've got a larger latency to get to your service, so it covers some of the fact that there's a, a slightly longer um, encode-decode time baked into that. It's, there's there's a number of things I would right now starting today I would look at Google's gRPC, um, which is based off of Protobufs, or Avro if you're more into the big data space, which is an Apache project, Apache Avro, or uh, there's an open source tool called Simple Binary Encoding, um, and I have links to that on some of my slide decks, but you can find it on GitHub, which is about ten times more efficient than anything else, but has a bunch of constraints to get to that. You can get encodings in um, you know, microseconds at, for fairly complex structures if you actually use very carefully tuned code for it. Okay. 
Um, how about the, uh, the concept that you have services and then your data services underneath that are changing frequently and in tandem, um, even though they're separated out? Um, is that a, like, the question was, is that an architectural smell that they're both changing? Um, you should, yeah. Um, there's a whole lot of questions here which are really about versioning and changing. Again, I have some pres I, I've done some talks on that subject, but I, I, did, I had to skip it today to fit things in. Um, if you're trying to, you basically what, want to be able to route traffic by version. So you want to have protocol, uh, route, protocol based versioning, you want routing, versioned routing, and you want to have be able to run multiple versions of things at the same time. So if you've got a bunch of services and you're introducing a new version of a service, you want to run it alongside the old one, and you want all of the old customers to talk to the old version, and only the person that really was looking for the new feature to actually deal with the fact they're talking to a brand new service that has that new feature. And eventually you gradually sort of garbage collect the old versions and upgrade everybody to the new version. So that's that's a short answer to a quite a long complex topic. But um, if you look on my my slide share, um, you can find a sort of more in depth um, discussion of that um, in in some previous uh, presentations I've given. Okay, and another question about configuration and change management, and and specifically if you have dozens of services that depend on each other. Um, is it actually safe to just upgrade one of those independently of the other ones in, let's say, a highly regulated industry like a bank, for example? Yeah, it's, uh, that's why I, so if you don't have version-aware routing, then it's dangerous to do that. So think about, I, I've got some new code, it's probably broken, I don't know, but I'm going to try. I throw it into production. A new version of the code is built, it goes into tests, it somehow manages to pass the built in, you know, the, the test driven development stress test that I've built. So then it comes a production candidate and becomes a canary and the system then puts a little bit of traffic on it from production and sees whether it appears to be working or not. If it looks like it's working, it will automatically become the new version, um, maybe running alongside the old stuff for a few hours to see if it blows up later or whether it's just, you know, it's sustainably a good version. So that's the that's the sort of mechanism to do something safely. There's a number of checks that will get rolled back if it breaks, but um, the fact I have something broken in production is not seen by anyone else until traffic routes to it. Um, and I can have it sitting there with no traffic to it and do my own testing against it to build up confidence that it's working. Um, but it basically enables test in production in an extremely safe way. But again, you have to be able to route between versions and manage version dependencies. And the, the thing here is you release, each version of a thing is the smallest possible change you could make. The cost of release is now basically zero. So you can, a, a releasing a feature, when your product release used to be 100 features developed by you know months of de developer time. Now we're talking about down to one line of code is fine to release, and you release it yourself, and the system releases it for you and makes sure nothing breaks. That's perfectly reasonable, and that release could be broken into multiple steps where every dependency of that release is actually varied one at a time. So you're only actually changing one build, one library in the build at a time to see if any of the new libraries in the build break your, your application. You can do this because you can release over and over again, and you can automate the flow for doing that. So that's kind of, it's getting easier and safer to do this as you go faster. That's that's the trick. And in highly regulated industries, that kind of is a bit mind-blowing for some people because they're so used to stuff getting bigger and breaking. But I'd, I'd summarize that in one thing. It's probably a good thought to leave leave it with. If you ever heard your, te your testing team say they need more time to test a release, your response should be, okay, we're going to release more often. Not we're going to give you more time to test. We're going to release twice as often, put half as much stuff in each release. That makes it easier to test, fewer complexities. And, if, and keep, that, keep speeding things up until there's only one thing in each release. And then it's really obvious what broke. It's easy to roll back. It's very easy to reason about and discover. So that's the trick. If, if it's hard to release, you're releasing too slowly. You need to speed up. Very good. Well, that's a, a good way to end uh, this talk. So I'd like to thank Adrian again for your presentation and your insightful answers.
And thanks to everybody who uh, participated in the, web the webinar today and, and uh, asked your questions. Thanks very much, everyone. Was yeah, it was great. Thank you. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at acm.org. Also, uh, please fill out our quick survey, which should be on the slides displayed right now. You can um, suggest future topics or speakers. And on behalf of ACM, Adrian Cockroft and myself, John Weatherill, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes the webinar.